Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for a day in the life of the DevSecOps professional. Um, this webinar is uh, brought to you by Sneak, Red Hat, and Port Shift. And we really appreciate you finding time for us. Um, as we all spend more time online, innovation becomes more important uh, in both our business lives and our professional lives. Containers and Kubernetes uh, enable innovation and also require changes uh, to get the most out of them, require changes to the way that we work together as teams. So today, uh, we're going to provide some examples of what those kinds of changes look like and some practical things that you can take away with you and back to your work. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Um, I'm Kirsten Newcomer, Director of Cloud and DevSecOps Strategy at Red Hat at our Cloud Platforms BU. Jay? Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Yeras. I'm head of cloud and cloud native solutions architecture here at Sneak. Dave? Yeah, hey, everyone. So my name is Dave Muir. I'm the uh, global partner solution architect at Red Hat for our security ISVs. I've been in the security space for about 10 years now um, and was recently hired into Red Hat to focus on uh, our wonderful security ISVs like uh, PortShift and Sneak. Great. Thanks, Dave. Ariel? Thank you, Kirsten. Hello, everyone. My name is Ariel Schoper, and I'm a VP Product Management in PortShift. Great. Thank you all. And you'll be hearing from all three of our panelists um, as we go through today's webinar. Um, we wanted to start by just kind of acknowledging that as all of us are spending more time online, so are the hackers. Right, so, um, and and because of that, we think it's really important that, uh, and because of the way containers and Kubernetes work, right, DevSecOps is more important than it ever was. So if we just take a quick look at the top threats to cloud computing, um, a couple of things will, will kind of leap out. One, data breaches. Uh, for any of you in the States, um, we know that a number of unemployment insurance fraud is tied back to data breaches from some time ago. Uh, don't know whether that kind of thing is showing up in other parts of the world as well. Misconfiguration, inadequate control, um, phishing, of course, through, uh, you know, account hijacking through phishing, insider threats, insecure, but we're, we're really focused on how can we help address all of these threats in for containers and Kubernetes in particular um, through the capabilities that Red Hat, Sneak, and PortShift bring to the market. Again, I don't really want to read all the threats. They're here. Uh, when you get the slides, you'll also have a link to, um, to the content and can read more for yourself. Similar to the overall set of threats we see for cloud computing, there are top threats for container security, right? Vulnerability, vulnerable packages or dependencies in the image. Again, configuration concerns related to the deployment settings. Sometimes images or pod deployments ask for more privileges than they really need. Access to the host file system network. Sometimes this is malicious and sometimes it's just a simple oversight. The way you really uh, tackle these problems is going to be same, whether the, the same, whether it's malicious or not. Excessive account permissions, that is for the service account, say that's deploying the application. Container networking, service to service communication is a key element here. And of course, how you manage secrets as well. So there are uh, definitely security methods available to help manage all of these threats. Um, typically at Red Hat, we think about container security in three major buckets. You need to defend the infrastructure for your container and orchestration platform. You need to control application security and as needed, extend the security capabilities for the platform with the broad ecosystem of partners that Red Hat has. We aren't gonna talk about all of the methods listed in this slide today, um, though we will hit on many of them. I want to kind of stress that even though kind of the, the technology changes, including the security technology that we use for containers and Kubernetes, many of the same principles still apply. So really what you're seeing here should not be uh, new 
if you're a security professional, you're thinking about how to secure these environments, but the tooling that you need to use can be new. So as we work, uh, as, as we go through this webinar, um, kind of you'll be learning, uh, again, some very concrete practical information that you can use uh, to secure your uh, DevOps environment. So we're gonna be talking both about uh, how Sneak can help you secure introduce security in the very early stages of your CICD pipeline, how OpenShift provides support uh, for the pipeline itself and for securing the platform, and then how PortShift can extend those security capabilities kind of all together. So um, we'll uh, go ahead and jump in. Again, there's many more things available to you from uh, Red Hat and our partners and we're gonna cover in today's presentation, but we're gonna get through as much as we possibly can. So, Jay, let me hand over to you. Thank you, Kirsten. And thank you to all the attendees that chose to spend your time here today and learn a little bit more about how can you can improve your security posture. So, I wanna dive a little bit deeper on that previous slide, the DevSecOps pipeline. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sneak and the products that comprise our platform um, and how that fits into um, that pipeline to help you secure your workloads. Sneak. So the Sneak platform is comprised of a couple different products that you can leverage today. Um, Sneak open source, Sneak container, Sneak infrastructure as code, and the Sneak Intel vulnerability DB uh, uh, that, that we use to fuel some of the insights that you'll be presented to you when you leverage some of these. So what I've done is I've also in, wanted to go into detail on the specific ones that I'm going to use in this example, uh, which will mainly be the Sneak Open Source and Sneak Container. And I have something special for you, Sneak. We'll talk about Sneak Open Source first. So a lot of this really, when we talk about shifting to the left, uh, you might be using tools today to scan your application code. Um, maybe some static code analysis tools, things like that. Um, but are you evaluating the dependencies that are part of that application? Um, this is where tools that provide what's called software composition analysis come into play. And Sneak Open Source provides that for you. It allows you to uh, discover and identify any vulnerabilities that may exist in your open source dependencies. And it also provides you actionable insights to be able to fix those vulnerabilities. Uh, early on in the process so that you don't have to worry about them later on down the chain when you get a report from your security auditors telling you that you have all these vulnerabilities that you need to fix. You'll have that insight early on in the process. Sneak. So the application dependencies are part of the equation, right? If you're building modern applications today, or if you're considering to build modern applications today, there's a number of different layers and containers undoubtedly is one of those. So where we're also looking at, while we're looking at our open source dependencies and vulnerabilities that might exist there, the fact is that there are also some vulnerabilities in the container images that we're consuming. So Sneak Container uh, allows you in the same manner as Sneak Open Source to get visibility into what these vulnerabilities are. Not only are you able to evaluate the base uh, image that you're using and get actionable insights on recommendations for upgrading that base image, but you also get application insights as well into that source code and those dependencies. Sneak. So I promised that there was something special. So what I've done is I've put together a self-paced workshop that goes hand in hand with this presentation and kind of guides you through this example. We talked about that DevSecOps pipeline earlier on, and there were some logos there, and I wanted to kind of illustrate firsthand uh, with some guided exercises on how you can actually implement this tool and how easy it is to really do this. So if you're using tools like this today, that's great. It's a good start. I also encourage you to take a look at how you can expand and improve that security posture by including additional checks and balances in that pipeline. 
And that's what we'll cover in that, in that workshop. We'll go through these steps. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that here today. And if you're interested in following along, you can open up a new tab in your web browser and visit solutions.sneak.io and you'll kind of walk through some of these exercises as I'm talking through them. Sneak. So I have a simplified version of that pipeline. And this is uh, what I would say, this is how you would secure your workflow using Sneak. There's a couple different components to this simple pipeline and it starts at the source. Um, so we have the ability of being able to provide visibility into these open source dependencies right from the IDE, leveraging our integration with Code Ready, uh, Red Hat Code Ready. And then there's also a couple other integrations that we're going to talk about, like our source code management integration um, and how we can monitor those re repos for any vulnerabilities that might be introduced later on and how we can fix them. The other part of the process is when we start building our application and I'll include a couple of techniques that you can utilize today using the Sneak CLI to be able to scan those applications as well as the container base image and then monitoring. Once we deployed our application, uh, being able to monitor for additional workloads that might have uh, been introduced out of band and how you can remediate those as well. Sneak. So Sneak is proud to have partnered with Red Hat and worked together on uh, delivering the Red Hat Code Ready dependency analytics uh, powered by Sneak. So what this is, this is available today in the uh, Visual um, VS Code uh, Marketplace. And you can download this, it integrates right into your IDE. And what it does is it provides insights into those open source dependencies right from within the IDE. So once you open up in this example, package.json, you'll see all your dependencies, and then you'll also be able to hover over each of those and get additional insights into what those vulnerabilities are. Sneak. Hand in hand with this is the powerful reporting that comes with Code Ready Dependency Analytics. And here you see in this screenshot, um, a consolidation of all of these issues for your, your application as well as some interesting tabs, like those vulnerabilities that are unique to Sneak. So you'll be able to, again, to get powerful insights on what's going on in your code and what you can do to solve some of these. Sneak. So I mentioned source code management integrations. This is an important component. You wanna start monitoring your repos if you're not already, so that you can start getting an assessment of what these vulnerabilities are now. I know I'm over here in the West Coast of the United States, but I could hear, I could hear the pain of, Jay, why are you telling us to show all these vulnerabilities? Well, you have a lot of technical debt. Your developers are pushed to produce new features and I get it. Having to get a long list of things to fix is cumbersome and you have to prioritize, but prioritization is key. And we're here to make your life easier. And one of the things that we offer with our SCM integrations, for example, is a sneak priority score. So there's a number of different vulnerabilities out there and some of them are all, well, there are, a lot of them are high uh, severity vulnerabilities, but they're not all created equal. And there's a number of factors that go into that. And we wanna make things easier for you and we wanna help you prioritize these accordingly. So the sneak priority score is a, a proprietary based algorithm that is used and it, it factors in a number of different objective and subjective var uh, variables to come up with a helpful prioritization of how you should be approaching some of these vulnerabilities to help you uh, mitigate some of those constraints right because you do have competing priorities you have to ship your product as quickly as possible and then you have all this technical debt that you have to resolve as well Another part of this also is with our uh, pull request. So from within the sneak console, once you've identified these vulnerabilities, you're able to open a fixed PR against that repo. And we uh, lessen the burden of figuring out what dependencies, the transitive dependencies are affected by this um, and all these vulnerabilities. And we provide you with a simplified means of just literally having a one click button that solves these for you. So again, very powerful tools that not just provide the uh, discoverability, but again, gives you those actionable insights. Sneak. So the next phase, we talked about 
different components to that workflow. And we talked about source and application dependencies, and we've covered that. Now we move on to building a container image. Many of you are familiar with this already. Um, you can experiment with this from the command line. Um, in this example, I'm kind of going through a sample exercise here. And again, the screenshot or, or the animation might be a little bit small, but if you're going through and walking through this as well through the workshop, you'll be able to see it a little bit clearer, but I'll speak to it. So Sneak also offers a lightweight, flexible, but powerful CLI. And this can be used in a number of different ways, but it can also be introduced in your existing uh, CI CD uh, pipelines to do additional scanning of your application and also importantly, your container images as well as they're being built. And what I'm doing in this example is doing just that, taking a, a sample Docker file, um, building that Docker file, but I'm also scanning that Docker file with Sneak. And what I'm doing in the process as, I'm, as my container is, built, is being built is I'm also bubbling up what are some of the um, vulnerabilities that are uh, there in my container image and on also what I can do to fix those. Sneak. So in this example, my workflow included uh, storing my container image in uh, Red Hat's uh, container uh, registry. So what I'm doing here also is monitoring for um, those vulnerabilities within the Sneak console. And what I can see is that I've had a recommendation to upgrade my base image. So I'm using in this particular application, uh, Node 6. And the recommendation is that I should upgrade to Node 14. And the reason is that it's going to lower my vulnerability count. So I'm mitigating some of this and improving my security posture just from doing a simple thing. And that's just in upgrading my base image to a higher version. And I'm able to see the exact uh, details of what those vulnerabilities are, and I can make an informed decision on whether or not that's appropriate for me or not. Sneak. So another component of this, uh, we talked about the, the container images, and now we've talked about securing those container images. But now what happens when our application has been deployed? And in this case, we're deploying it uh, to Kubernetes cluster and on OpenShift. So we have Sneak Operator. Um, again, we worked with Red Hat and we published a Sneak Operator that runs on an OpenShift cluster. And what it does is it monitors my applications, uh, my Kubernetes applications that are running, uh, my applications that are running on Kubernetes on, on OpenShift. So Sneak. What this is going to do is it's I can I can add additional workloads as um, now that the the operator has been running on my uh, cluster. And what this is going to do is give me another dimension of where my security posture is. And what I'm looking for here are the misconfigurations in my um, in my applications. So this example, again, is purposeful. Um, I wanted to show some failed uh, uh, instances here. Uh, these are missing or uh, or incorrectly configured security context within my Kubernetes manifests. And what this is doing is it's bubbling these up again. So that gives you visibility into some misconfigurations that you might need to address. Now, they're not vulnerabilities, but they do expose you to um, potential breaches and things of that nature. So you definitely want to be aware of these and you also want to have a plan in place to be able to mitigate those as best possible. Neek. Now, this is all great, but what does it look like in the real world? Well, I wanted to include a couple of different examples. And when, when I was working through this and going through the vulnerabilities for this example application, this example application contains a number of vulnerabilities and it does so intentionally because it's used for demo purposes. So what I'm doing here is highlighting three in particular. One of them is the ST package. So this is a Node.js application. Uh, there's a front end and a back end component to it, and it's running in that cluster. Uh, what ST does is it allows for um, simple things like the about page. So this application in particular, as I said, is a web for, has a web front end, and it's a basic to do app, and it includes an about page, and that's great. But it leverages this package. What this does is exposes you to directory traversal. So this example on the CLI is me uh, pretending to be a bad actor. And uh, basically, I've identified your host, and now I'm going to execute a couple commands in the CLI 
to uh, list the contents of your directory. So I'm able to navigate and then potentially exploit some of those by manipulating some of those files or compromising information. So again, um, what is the risk of knowing about this and not addressing it? Well, you've just put yourself uh, at the mercy of a potential bad actor to be able to exploit some of these sneak. The other one I wanted to uh, kind of highlight here was cross-site scripting. And this comes to us by way of the marked package. Now, the marked package is used in our application because it allows us to include some markdown in our to-do app. So what you see here is a, a screenshot of the to-do app called Goof. And what I have on the other side is a little snippet, a code snippet. So I'm gonna cut to the chase with it because um, I can also substitute some markdown with some JavaScript. Now this one's very benign because all I'm doing is really just providing a pop-up here, uh, but it, it's intended to illustrate the point. And the point is that I could also include some malicious code there as well. Um, so I have access to the application and now I can in introduce some JavaScript in there that can do some other potentially uh, bad things to your uh, environment. So again, Important to know about them and important to see about uh, to see how these are uh, could potentially be used in the wild by um, some uh, potential bad actors that uh, are aware of these vulnerabilities and are able to exploit them. Sneak. Now, the third one that I wanted to bring up is probably one of the worst ones, right? So this is regular expression denial of service, and this comes to us by way of the MS package which um, is um, transitive to the humanized MS, which was included in our application. And what this does is it basically does a simple conversion of time. So I can do reminders for myself like, hey, I need to uh, you know, patch my servers in you know, the next hour or so. Well, what it's doing though is if I have access to the terminal again from the terminal, um, I can issue some commands and I can actually interact and create some of these um, alerts as well. And if I do a mismatch, you might notice in my snippet of code, I've purposely misspelled minutes with uh, with a, with incorrect spelling. What this will end up doing is it'll go through recursively and then just end up crashing your system. It'll be a denial of service, right? So um, I don't recommend you ex actually execute this one if you uh, are going through the workshop and are en end up uh, implementing some of these. But it's important to note that, again, some of these can be very powerful and can actually bring down your systems. Uh, and nobody wants to have that day where they have that escalation. So um, this kind of wraps up my portion. Again, I encourage everyone to go through the solutions.sneak.io site and take a look at some of these examples because I will walk you through on how to implement all of these components that I mentioned, like code ready dependency analytics, the uh, source code integrations, uh, the container registry integration, and then deploying a uh, sneak operator. But I don't want to leave you with doom and gloom. Uh, I want to pass this off to my good friend Dave, who's going to talk about Red Hat's Secure by Design platform and how it can help you, again, improve your security posture. Great. Thanks so much, Jay. And just before uh, Dave jumps in, I want to um, think, you know, appreciate all the, just kind of restate all the elements of the pipeline that Jay called out, right? You uh, have capabilities available to you right in the IDE, whether you're using code-ready containers for developing on your laptop, code-ready workspaces uh, for a shared environment for all your developers, the integration with Sneak gives you gives the development team upfront information about issues they need to address much sooner than if you wait until even the CI process or, you know, worst case, the CD process to get that data back. Integration available also in your container registry so that you have multiple locations uh, for this and the great guidance that Sneak provides to help the development team. Um, Dave, over to you to talk about uh, Kirsten, OpenShift. There is, yes. There is, a, there is a question in the Q&A for Dave, and there is a poll after Dave's uh, presentation. So I want to remind great. the audience. Thanks, Ariel. So um, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I was going to point that out as well. There's there's a poll going on, a couple of questions that we'll get to, but uh, really appreciate that um, session there, Jay. It was all good stuff. And yeah, I, I plan to talk about um, Red Hat's Secure by Design platform. I got to tell you, I love the uh, sneak 
code for changing the next slide. I, I'm not as creative. I'm just going to say next slide, please. <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, it's really talking about, um, you know, if you attempt to implement the community version of Kubernetes, it's, it's really difficult because um, you have to add all of these extra things on top of it. <clears throat> and of course, you know, by the way, this isn't a slight on Kubernetes. Uh, if you visit the docs at kubernetes.io, you'll find a, a section entitled, <clears throat> you know, what Kubernetes is not. And you'll see a handful of items like uh, uh, that relate to these bullets, like Kubernetes does not deploy source code or does not build your application. Um, you'll see other things that doesn't um, provide application level services or dictate logging or monitoring alerting. But of course, you're going to need all of this stuff in an enterprise and a whole lot more, which you can see listed here. And so the risks associated you know, with that, with trying to get that community version of, of Kubernetes done right, becomes uh, pretty straightforward in my mind. It's you know, the adoption of your teams using Kubernetes dramatically decreases. Trust in the platform that you're trying to implement is in question because you know, you'll need to figure out all of these security controls, which I've highlighted here. Uh, in the bullets. The next slide, please. Now, the good news is you don't have to look any further. You can just let Red Hat do all the hard work for you with a secure by design platform. You know, that, that includes all these features. And all these features have been designed with security in mind. Um, it starts with a container host, which of course is Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CoreOS. Um, and so, in order to secure your containers at the boundaries, and help you protect your host from container escapes, uh, you'll want to look at the four red pillars in the diagram to the right. So you have SE Linux, that provides mandatory access controls, uh, namespaces for multi-tenancy, you've got secure computing mode to control system calls, and then control groups. Uh, that allows you to isolate resource usage on things like CPU and memory. Now there's a ton of security features included in OpenShift. Um, some are shown here in the bolded list to the left, and I'm going to take you through uh, the ones in bold over the next few slides. So next slide, please. And of course, we all uh, saw Jay talk about sneak powering Red Hat Code Ready Dependency Analytics. Um, and to add to that conversation and sort of continue the journey of a DevSecOps professional. I wanted to mention Red Hat's cloud native IDE product, which is uh, called Code Ready Workspaces. It's based on Eclipse J, and the dependency analytics plugin um, is one of the plugins available in Code Ready Workspaces. Now, being a former uh, developer myself, I know it may be tough to transition off of a traditional laptop you know, based IDE setup, but there are a couple of things that frustrated me that um, are shown here in this slide which was onboarding to a new project. And then the whole, you know, it works on my uh, machine issues. So the upstream Eclipse Che project from the beginning set out to um, resolve these issues with a different paradigm. And it's basically to place everything the developer needs in a set of containers so that the developer can have their own pod, feels like, you know, your own laptop, but everything is uh, easy to share because it's the same environment. And especially relating to our discussion today, um, everything's more secure because the source code is protected because it's not in you know, some laptop, some hard to secure laptop somewhere. The next slide, <clears throat> the next thing that a dev uh, sec ops professional would want to think about in their day is you know, how, what security controls do I add into the CI CD stage in my pipeline. Well, Red Hat offers OpenShift pipelines. This is based on the open source project Tecton. Um, it's a Kubernetes native serverless CI CD technology. Now, uh, pipelines by nature isn't necessarily a security feature. However, it's a critical integration point uh, for, for application and analysis tools like Sneak, SCA tools, software, compos software composition analysis tools and analyzing images. And this is really a natural evolution of the features and integration Jay was talking about because Pipelines offers a very simple way uh, to hook in these tools through tasks 
and the team at Sneak have actually done some great work on creating a set of uh, tectong tasks, tectong tasks, say that really quick 10 times, <laughs> that are available on GitHub. And, um, and so in the next slide, I'll transition over to a demo that, uh, that shows you how to deploy OpenShift pipelines and run a, a sneak scan in only a couple minutes. So let me go ahead and your hub and search for OpenShift. Dave, you are on mute. No one can hear you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sneak. Thank you, Ariel. Let me go back then. Yeah, I forgot that uh, puts, puts us all on mute. Uh, OpenShift and looking at the operator hub where you can easily find the OpenShift pipelines operator and install it. Um, and then if um, this is already installed in my cluster, so you can see it here, installed uh, operator. Um, and once it's installed, you'll get this pipelines left navigation item, which is on, uh, which is shown here. And then uh, in order to create pipelines, um, and if you have a custom task, you'll need to uh, install that here. So I'm showing you the sneak node task, the node.js task. It's a real easy command. You can either use kubectl or oc to apply this YAML file and then create your secret, which contains your sneak.io token. Once you do that, that will actually create a task for you uh, in the project, in the uh, namespace that you are, um, that you've created in. So if I go to my pipelines demo namespace, you can see the sneak node task there um, that's now been installed. Now, if we go to the pipeline, um, I have a pipeline that has actually um, scanning the same application Jay just showed you. So I'm gonna just edit this pipeline, delete the sneak node task and show you how easy it is uh, to add it back in. Um, so because I installed it from the command line, it shows up in that dropdown and all I have to do is click the node task and configure it. And you can either do a sneak test or sneak monitor um, and fill in other parameters as well. One of the parameters is an input resource. So a resource, the Tekton resource is things like a GitHub location or an image. And to create that resource, uh, which you see created here is very easy as well. If you go over to the OpenShift uh, docs, it'll it'll give you a command with a TKN resource create command, ask you a couple questions, and this is an example of basically creating a Git repo. So I, I've done that. That resource is then added, and it's very easy to then add that into your um, into your pipeline. Now pipelines, you can add tasks in a serial format, or you can add other tasks um, in parallel. So it's very easy visually to create you know, an entire pipeline. So for example, you're, you can see I'm doing a git clone, I'm doing a build up, and then creating an image, in this case, um, S2I Node.js image. Now, if we look at some of the pipeline runs here uh, with, with this sneak task, uh, we can see there's a, a three here. We'll take a look at one that failed. And it actually failed by design. This is a sneak a test, test run. And this basically failed because there's a bunch of vulnerabilities, right? Same application that Jay just talked about. Um, and it, should, it provides you all the details and you know, some remediation information as well. Now, if we go and look at the um, successful uh, run. This is a monitor, uh, sneak monitor, and this places the uh, results and pushes the results up to sneak.io, which you can see um, here in uh, the project that I own up on sneak.io. So that is the video. Um, let's see if we can go back to the slides now. Perfect. Thank you, Kirsten.
Yeah, so now I wanted to transition a bit to more of uh, runtime security controls. <clears throat> and um, one of the features I talked about at the beginning of my sec section was SE Linux. And uh, so one of the way to see that SE Linux is enabled is through security context constraints. And they're called in upstream Kubernetes pod security policies. So this feature controls uh, permissions for pods. You can use SECs to define a set of conditions that a pod must run with in order for it to be accepted into the cluster. It's like admission control. Um, the example shown here is a restricted SEC with an OpenShift. <clears throat> it's, um, and you can see that you know, pods here with a restricted SEC can't run as privileged. They can't access the host network or ports. And so really the purpose of these SECs is to ultimately limit the ability of the container to negatively impact uh, the infrastructure. And there are eight different SECs that exist in OpenShift uh, by default. Now you might be asking, so why are there two different names? Well, uh, pod security policies, which are based on code from Red Hat, are in beta right now in the community version of Kubernetes. About five years ago, this feature did not exist in Kube. So Red Hat needed a way to deliver these capabilities to customers and in OpenShift 3.0, we gave it the name Security Context Constraints. All right, next slide. And uh, let's start talking about network security in the next slide. And one of the features to, def uh, to really look at is uh, service mesh. And this, is, this helps you with network segmentation. Uh, this is especially useful if you're building cloud native apps. Um, OpenShift Service Mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for handling service-to-service -service communication. And it's responsible for connecting, securing, and monitoring uh, microservices-based apps within OpenShift. And as is tradition with Red Hat, uh, it's based on open source products or projects like Istio, Kiali, and Jaeger. Um, and as you can see here, Gartner's recommendation is to use a service mesh for segmentation, authentication, authorization, but also that you should look at augmenting the service mesh with a third-party tool to harden it, which is exactly what PortShift can do for you to automate the complexity of microsegmentation configs in Istio. And Ariel will talk more about that you know, coming up shortly. And so in the next slide, um, and this is something else Ariel will talk about, is uh, network policies. This also contributes to network segmentation. So I wanted to spend a couple minutes uh, to discuss in demo uh, network policies. Basically, a Kubernetes network policy is a specification that you like the one you see here in the YAML, and it details how groups of pods are allowed to communicate with each other and other network endpoints. So I will go to another video here. Got to remember to put myself off mute when I start it. For this uh, uh, video, you can see that I started with a, a screen capture of my desktop background, which rotates, but uh, this one was my, uh, my middle child. She actually is 17 years old right now and still gives me these faces. We go on with the uh, demo. Um, this is a example that is actually out on GitHub on um, Red Hat's security demos, and you can uh, run it yourself. But it's, it's basically um, showing how pod-to-pod -pod communication works with network policies. And it, it works with three different projects. So I created three different projects here. All have um, a client pod, uh, Red Hat Demo 1, 2, and 3. And the third one has this Hello World container as well. So if we go down to the network policies, there's no network policy defined, which means all communication is available. So I'm going to RSHH into, the, uh, into one of the client pods and then run a curl command um, to that hello world, and you can see I'm connected. Now I'm going to create a network policy, and when you do that through the UI, it's very easy. It provides you samples of different network policies and visuals of how that all works. I'm going to create the um, limit access to current namespace network policy, which is the deny other namespaces policy. And if you go back, 
You can see that was created. This is in Red Hat Demo 3. So I'm gonna go back to my command line, try that curl command again, and you can see, voila, I now cannot get into um, that pod through another namespace. So that was a quick uh, demo, but you can go through that same lab. It's really easy and uh, explanatory lab up in uh, the Red Hat uh, security demos. All right, so if we go back to these slides, I'll wrap up my session. We've looked at a couple security features of OpenShift, uh, but there is just so much more uh, value that OpenShift provides. You remember my slide about Kubernetes done right is hard? Well, Red Hat has spent the last five years with both open source communities and our customers getting Kubernetes right. And the result is what you see in this slide. It's important to note that um, OpenShift is Kubernetes, plus all of these out-of-the-box additional services for both developers and operation teams. You know, instead of trying to implement this all yourself, why not use a supported and trusted enterprise Kubernetes platform that has all of these included services and things like hundreds of defect and performance fixes, 200 plus validated integrations, you get continuously delivered security patches. This is the uh, value of Red Hat and OpenShift. Okay, so that does it for me. I will, I think I will hand it back over to Kirsten who will introduce the next session with Ariel on PortShift. Great, thanks so much, Dave. Um, terrific to see kind of those, those capabilities um, available by default in OpenShift. Um, appreciate the demo of configuring network policies, right? This is one of the areas of real value in Kubernetes as well as OpenShift, both network policies and service mesh capabilities. That said, right, it does require configuration. Um, the simplest way to configure your network policies, as Dave showed, is, is so that uh, all pods within a particular uh, kube namespace or OpenShift project are able to talk to each other. But micro-segmentation um, can, can give you a lot more control than that. And so I'm going to hand off to Ariel to talk about some of the additional value add in uh, protecting the runtime. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you, Dave, for the great presentation. Um, and as Kirsten pointed out, let's talk about what can go wrong. So you passed all the checks in the CI, CD, you fixed everything uh, in your deployment, and now you think you know you can uh, sit down and relax, but things can go wrong. Uh, how do we know? We just need to check the headlines. So Kirsten, if you can make like three clicks, so one click is from recently, just two months ago, a, a campaign which was discovered in Azure Kubernetes. There's another attack which was discovered by the Aqua research team about containers, uh, which post-deployment start attacking and just misconfiguration that can uh, cause any challenges. So Kirsten, if you can move one slide next. And you ask yourself, you know, what can go wrong? What did I do wrong? I passed all the checks and everything was perfectly fine. But now we can see you know, that since typically most containers are compromised post deployments, but interestingly, a lot, of, a lot of those attacks stem from just security misconfiguration. Uh, you expose your dashboard, either the Kubernetes or you expose an applicative dashboard. Uh, you use an unauthorized image or an unauthorized registry. Uh, maybe you didn't put in list privileges. Kubernetes offer uh, a very powerful tool that you can allow, restrict the powers and restrict capabilities of users, groups, service accounts, which allow you, of course, to minimize the potential impact. Um, and as Kirsten and Dave mentioned, just you forgot to put network policies, everyone can communicate with each other. That means that if I didn't, if I did something wrong, the attack can propagate uh, between the different elements in the cluster. Next slide. I want to go with you and kind of dive into one of the most common misconfiguration uh, that we see over and over again. And this is a recent uh, disclosure from Microsoft Azure Security Center. So the Azure Security Center uh, discovered a crypto mining campaign uh, on Kubernetes cluster. And the campaign was targeting Kubeflow. Kubeflow is an open source framework for machine learning task on Kubernetes. 
Um, it's a powerful, uh, po powerful, popular uh, application which is being a lot in use. Now, one of the ch one of the I would say the promising things about machine learning tasks is usually you run them in clusters where the nodes have multi multi CPUs. A lot of them are using GPUs, so you have a lot of compute power uh, under your hand. Now, when they analyzed a series of attacks which they discover, they found out that one common thing for all of those uh, compromised uh, clusters was the fact that the dashboard was exposed. The Kubelo has a dashboard, uh, and this dashboard, which we'll show you in a minute, is very powerful, can do a lot of things that uh, almost unrestricted uh, permissions. Uh, and what happened was that this this Kubelo was, this dashboard, the Kubelo feature was exposed to any, anyone's access. Now, the default deployment of this dashboard was that through using an ingress gateway, using Istio for network, uh, for all the network uh, connectivity, for network policies, and using the Istio ingress gateway to create routes and restrict it, or at least the default setting will requiring the users to do local host tunneling, which of course is a bit more restrictive, limited capabilities, and what happened was that users just modify this ingress gateway policy to turn it into a load balancing service that allow all the developers and all the users to just simply access the dashboard. The challenge was that not only developers and users access it, but also some malicious actors access it and use those powerful clusters to run multiple crypto mining sites. And this is just a simple misconfiguration that caused a use use damage. Can you go to the next slide? Now, the, the surprising thing about it, it was it's not something new. So exposed dashboard for those who are monitoring or tracking the security at, uh, world of Kubernetes or the potential attacks, you know that all the famous attacks, all the notable high-profile attacks which were reported uh, somewhere around 2018, 2019, were all using the same mistake. There was an, an exposed dashboard. No one knew that uh, the dashboard is exposed. All of them uh, were using Kubernetes dashboard. I don't know if they were using, but definitely they were deploying it. Now, before Kubernetes 1.11, all the dashboards um, were exposed without login. Uh, even if they had login, it was mandatory. You can just uh, skip it. Uh, the dashboard was exposed to all the services. And more importantly, dashboard had capabilities to do any kubectl command. So any cluster admin command, any uh, command that a user can do, the dashboard was able to do it. So that's pretty much giving the keys to your safe to everyone who just wander around uh, and looking for an exposed dashboard, and I'll show you in a minute how easy it is to see that as well. Can you go to the next slide? So now, while perhaps Kubernetes dashboard exposure is much harder these days because it's deployed with minimal role-based access control, so their hour back is minimized, and of course it can really, it's a little bit restricted. In order to log in, you cannot just pass skip or put in, you know, a 111, you need to have a bearer token, which you need to create. And of course, it's deployed in the cube system namespace, so it's easier to see if it is used or not used, or perhaps uh, not to expose it uh, to all the services. And again, if you do want to check if your how your Kubernetes dashboard uh, behave and where it is, it's fairly easy to touch it. You can look for the label Kubernetes dashboard, and it's easy to detect it. Now, it's much harder to detect applicative dashboards, like the cube flow. How would you come to think that you have a workload, you have a workload which have, you know, the dashboard workload, you have running multiple workloads. You can see, I will show you in a minute how many uh, pods uh, this typical application, this framework spins up, that's a lot. And then you ask yourself, how would I, you know, uh, find or how would I secure myself? So one of the tips that we in Portchief do in order to avoid those uh, misconfigurations is do a careful inspection of the role-based role access control and the role banding. We want to check what roles were attached to each to each pod or to each service account uh, application, and we will see verbs that either use create, update, or use star. And we look at the resources and see resources which are using, you know, elements like pod deployment, uh, service endpoints, services. We understand there is something here that you know is very powerful. Then our next check is to check if are those powerful uh, pods or powerful uh, service accounts 
also uh, also using services which are exposed to the to the public. If someone can access them from the outside. They're using like load balancing services if there is a route uh, from the ingress gateway, and we're making those checks to verify that no one by mistake uh, opened this door uh, for everyone. One more click, and let's go through a quick. Uh, demonstration of how you can detect and protect. So first you can see this Shodan tool. This is just an example of a tool that you can use to find publicly facing endpoints in the internet, right? And if you can see the screen, and Christian, if you can put it on a large full screen, then you can see that we deploy here on our cluster, we deploy this uh, cube flow. Uh, and you can see that two things caught our eye. One eye was the Argo UI, and the second one was the central dashboard uh, pods which were being deployed. Now, in order to check if those are really has some, you know, uh, significant exposure, what we do we analyze their permissions, their role, what roles were what role binding uh, those resources had. You can see that if I look at Port Shift UI and I look for all the high risk uh, high risk owners. And then it's easy to find uh, a central dashboard. I'm going to see it. When I look at the central dashboard and I click on it, I see it has two high risk. If I want to analyze those two high risks, then I can find that I have a cluster role and I have a namespace role. If you look at the cluster role, which is a bit suspicious, you can see that I have, um, I have authorities on events, namespaces, and nodes. Which is probably, probably like you know, powerful resources I need to pay attention to. And if I look at the namespace uh, role, then you can see the secrets uh, are secrets are exposed. Then my next stage is to understand that I have a resource which can access my secrets. Okay, it can access all the nodes, the services, and the endpoints. That's the important thing. Now you understand that why you need to do this. Uh, at least you know the default policy behind the ingress gateway was to use the port forwarding. With port forwarding, uh, I can make sure that no one can access it um, unless it's part unless it's part of the cluster, which is uh, a fairly relatively a, a good technique. Now, what users did was to change it because it's uh, problematic, it's challenging, and they moved it into public facing. Now, in port shift, if you go to the runtime, okay, and then you can check that the deployments, we detect those uh those uh those workloads which are public facing we also change take the tech words which were changed or modified like the policy was modified and changed uh post deployment now after understanding that we have an exposed dashboard the next thing is to define the network policy that will prevent it and this rule which can apply to a specific dashboard or to any dashboard is just allow that if you have, that you want to prevent external access from your pod or from your dashboard um, when you're detecting it. It's very simple uh, to define it. We use, a, we use a service mesh to allow to powerful, powerful, uh, powerful policies. And now we block it, I apply the policy, and I have this uh, block, I have this you know, rule that blocking any communication between uh, external users and our dashboard. So any external attempt to access our dashboard will be blocked as Dave showed before in the network policies. If we move to the next slide, this issue shows the importance of network policies and how we can, and the setting of those policies. Now sometimes all of it can be like a large, big pain, require a lot of settings, tuning, multiple systems that monitor and govern and have potential for mistakes. Now, in Port Shift, we believe that, you know, creating a network policy is essential. Uh, adding Istio to the game can definitely provide very large benefit uh, to users just because, you know, with the ingress gateways, which is much more powerful and has more capabilities now to restrict uh, and to govern what the access into the, into the cluster. Uh, the policy engine for internal and external or other resources is very powerful. And also encryption uh, can be done seamlessly, and this is very important uh, as a precautious step 
for all your traffic. But again, it requires a lot of config configuration and sometimes it could be neglected. And the key for successful policies, we believe, is in the shifting left approach. So if we're going to let developers define those network policies, okay, um, and those policies will be automatically deployed into the cluster when the service is deployed, uh, that will be like you do like you know a huge leap, you know, a huge step forward. Now, obviously, we need to let security teams to create like framework or guardrails that within those one that have super have like higher uh, priorities or govern the rules that developers create so we can make sure that the, the corporate policies are still maintained. But nevertheless, uh, having those, uh, giving this power to developers will smooth things, will make them faster, will assure that we don't expose things uh, unintentionally. Next slide. So what we Portshift believe and what we create is the ability for developers to create network policies manifests, which include the services, uh, the permissible communication, what can be accessing uh, the services, what the servers can access, uh, exposure to external um, uh, communication, and of course the encryption state. Now, those, policy, those policies can be deployed as part of the Helm chart or any uh, configuration file which is being deployed, and then when you when you when we port if we know we scan those configuration file we automatically uh apply this rule uh obviously making sure that you do not contradict with the existing uh default rules set by the security team next slide so in the next slide i created like uh, a small example and this is an example of this kind of a manifest so you can see that there's a, a crd or port shift policy uh, and the metadata is the name of the service we want to use. You know, the internal access, you can see with the Postgres uh, database. External, we allow the service to uh, uh, communicate with any external services, but we do restrict uh, internal access to this service. Um, and this is just, you can add this as part of your Helm charts where you define and you manifest all the services and the deployments of your new service. Next slide. And this is just a small example of how it's been done in reality is that this is our YAML file, the one with that we just uh one that we just uh described. You can see it over here. Then the next stage uh would be to scan it uh as part of yours as part of our uh CD scan. So when you want to deploy it uh in, in port shift, we scan the deployment file. So we'll scan this uh YAML file, the CRD. Uh, when it's ready. So you can see in the bottom of the screen uh, this Helm command, the Helm, uh, Helm, Helm port shift uh, command that we scan this Helm chart. Let it run for a second. And then the result is going to be shown here in the network policy that now we can have this port shift policy uh, our Nginx pod can communicate with the front-end pod, uh, which both were uh, part of the services defined in this uh, YAML file, in this CRD. Now, port shift, our security, we secure just a little bit about port shift. We secure users from CI, CD, deployment, and runtime. Uh, we usually integrate in the CI to check vulnerabilities, to look the CI Docker CIS benchmark, uh, to sign the image. At the CD phase, we scan for permissions, security contests, secrets, and network policies. In deployments, we just harden the deployment. We verify deployment is secure, the role base, access control is defined, is not overly uh, permissive. And in runtime, we allow users to create declarative network policies, which are essential for micro-segmentation. We try to simplify the deployment, make it easier for the, uh, for you know, for users to deploy and to segment the network, traffic encryption, and of course, cluster protection, protecting cluster from uh, anomalies. Yes, next slide, we can go to the next slide. So the benefit of deploying port shift operator into the into the OpenShift cluster, one more click, 
we are an agentless solution. It's an admission controller, so there's no need to deploy agents on every node. You can get a single plane of glass for your containers and OpenShift elements security, and we can provide you this uh, vast protection that we just discussed. We, next slide. Uh, PortShift also integrate with uh, with Kubernetes network security. We integrate with Istio Service Mesh. Okay, so we secure. Uh, we using Istio to provide uh, zero trust inside the cluster and outside the cluster, so you can secure. The cluster, we can expand it to resources which are outside the cluster. Uh, we can create, you know, multi-cluster communication, and we can even expand the certificate to use external CAs for those who are sensitive uh, for their uh, CA signing and require extra level of security and this at this point as well. Next. That's about it for my side. Thank you very much. Hey. Kirsten, you got the stage. Great. Thanks so much, Ariel. Um, so as promised, right, we have walked through uh, some practical steps and tooling available to you to implement those steps um, using both OpenShift Sneak and PortShift uh, for those capabilities. Again, you get to leverage the built-in capabilities of Red Hat uh, Tooling, including Code Ready and OpenShift, uh, the integration between Sneak and Code Ready, the integration between PortShift and OpenShift. So, if you want to supplement uh, the built in RBAC security context constraints, uh, the built in, um, you know, make it easier to use network policies in OpenShift, uh, easier to kind of evaluate the, net, the service mesh policies that you might implement with OpenShift service mesh integration with the Tekton pipeline, all of that is available to you through Red Hat and our partners. Um, and I hope that you have seen concretely how these solutions can be used to assess for vulner vulnerabilities in your container images, provide guidance on how to address those very early in the life cycle, assess configuration issues. As we noted that at the beginning of this session, misconfigurations are one of the main ways that both cloud native solutions and containers and Kubernetes solutions uh, become vulnerable. You can assess for excessive permissions and excessive role bindings. You can look for exposed secrets. Again, we can help you manage uh, your network policies and your mesh policies in a much more automated fashion. So that's what we had for you today. I think we have a few um, minutes left to do Q&A. So I am going to um, stop sharing and maybe ask for some final comments uh, from our presenters. Um, Jay, would you like to start? And maybe turn on your camera? Yes, thank you. A little slow there. Right. Yeah, no, once again, I just want to thank all the attendees for participating in today's webinar. I hope you found uh, the information that we provided useful and um, hope you, hopefully you'll be able to implement some of that. I did go ahead and respond to some of the folks that had some questions already. Um, again, if you're interested in taking a closer look and even following through some of the examples that I presented today, those are available today for free uh, at solutions.sneak.io and you can go through those uh, self-paced workshops. Uh, you can also try Sneak. We have a very generous uh, free tier as well. So you, it's very simple to sign up and you can uh, take a look at the product and evaluate and see whether or not it helps you. But thanks again, everyone. Great, thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. I, you know, similar to Jay, just wanted to thank everybody for attending. And, um, you know, it, what I wanted to just mention is that if you think about this, a day in the life of DevSecOps, this is really bringing together a, an enterprise solution, you know, for for you, for um, for your enterprise, not just, hey, this is Kubernetes, and I need to piecemeal these things together. If you think about CNCF and all the hundreds of different certified technologies that you can place and install on top of Kubernetes, it gets pretty daunting. So, um, so I think, you know, hopefully this was a good example of a, of an enterprise solution that you can deploy today. Great, thanks. Ariel, any last thoughts? Thank you, Kirsten. No, I think I second Jay and second Dave. I think, you know, uh, 
Security is not an afterthought. You need to plan it carefully. You need to make sure you don't neglect. Sometimes things can go wrong, not purposely, but it happens. And you need to be stay tuned and monitor yourself. Great, thank you. And um, so if there are any additional questions, I think we have answered everything we're seeing in the Q&A today. Um, apologies, I know there were a couple of uh, Chrome notification things that showed up. I don't know if they were in recordings or what, but heck, you know, that's life online these days, right? So um, also wanted just to kind of in a uh, final remark from me is to say that the tooling and technology are key. Automation is key for this new world, um, but culture is a key part of this scenario as well, right? And so we hope that maybe one of the things that this recorded uh, this recorded webinar can help you with is something that you can show to um, your dev, your ops, and your security teams to help them understand ways in which we can work together collaboratively in a new fashion uh, with new tooling and new technology to, to ensure that jointly we are protecting the applications and the solutions that we deploy that bring business value from the threats that are out there. So thank you again for your time. Um, be safe, be well, and we'll look forward to meeting with you another time. Um, I guess I did forget, uh, to put up email addresses at the end. Maybe I should just do that really quickly. Uh, and you're welcome to reach out to any of us to do too many controls. There we go. So I will. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kirsten, for this. Great moderation. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Take care.